the recording then. So welcome everyone, also if you're watching this on Moodle. Um, today is uh, bio proteins. So um, we're just doing all the biomolecular levels in order one by one. So we started off with looking at DNA, uh, then we had RNA, and of course the next level is going to be proteins. Uh, so there will be a little bit of overlap. Um, I will be talking again about the ribosome and yeah, because it's important for protein synthesis as well. Uh, and we will add some more information about like things like wobble bases. Um, and we will start beginning to introduce some of the um, techniques like uh, mass spectrometry um, and NMR to um, how to measure like these 3D and 4D structures um, but we'll get to that so um, did I make an overview slide yeah so the overview slide will start of course with history so because proteins have a history as well slightly different history than RNA slightly different than DNA um, we will talk about structure because when we're talking about proteins then structure is everything um, yeah, like in DNA sequence is everything um, in RNA it's kind of a mix of sequence and structure um, but in protein structure is the only thing that counts um, uh, we will talk a little bit about how to identify proteins like how to do purification um, and then we will do some function prediction um, so yeah, looking at protein domains um, and then there's going to be a very complex and confusing part which in which I try to explain you guys what is an orthologue, a paralog and a xenolog and the difference between an in paralog and out paralog and, and all of these things. And then we will also have uh, a little bit of phylogenetic trees. Um, there will be assignments like last week there I was planning to make assignments but since I was doing a, um, a big like Paper, or not paper, well I've, I've submitted two papers in the last week, but um, besides the paper I was doing a, um, a, a job application, um, so um, that, that took up all of my time, because that had to be finished before yesterday, um, and we spent a lot of, a lot of effort on that. So, uh, But today, um, proteins, so let's just start. Um, I think actually if we're quick we can do it in like two hours. Um, but of course, if I'm rushing through it and, and you have like, you want to ask questions, then feel free, of course. All right, so the history of protein starts in around 1800, um, slightly before, so like 1795. Um, and um, in, in at that point, like people were doing a lot of chemistry. So it's the uh, age of enlightenment, right? And people start, had, like the discovery of electricity and like optics and these kinds of things and that made it possible um, for new discoveries to be made uh, and in the 1800 they figured out that proteins were a very distinct class of biological molecules um, and um, only 38 years later we have the first real description of what is a protein and uh, that a protein is more or less um, consisting of amino acids so that, that it's just a chain build up um, so in 1985, we have the discovery of x-rays by um, Curry, I think. Yeah, I think she was the inventor originally. Um, but then it takes like another like 20 years, 40 years uh, for the first x-ray diffraction experiments. And only then do people start learning on the 3D structure of proteins. Um, because when you do an X-ray diffraction, uh, you're able to figure out where the side chains of the uh, amino acids are, and hey, you can see that there are different side chains, and you can start getting an idea of how a protein is shaped. So in 1926, um, we have the protein. Proteins are enzymes. Um, so people figured out that proteins are actually enzymes. So that means that they are um, they are involved in chemical processes right so they can speed up or slow down the transformation of chemicals to another chemical um, but they are not used in this in that process so they, they they do take part in the in the chemical reaction um, but they don't get used during the chemical reaction and that is of course very um, important because if you would use up um, proteins in chemical reactions then in the end uh, you would have to produce a lot of proteins so in 1933, they figured out the theory of the secondary structure of proteins. Um, before, people had no real idea on how um, proteins would look like. They did do X-ray diffraction experiments, um, but the theory of the secondary structure of proteins is when people started realizing that hydrogen bonds and sulfur bonds are actually the 
um, main ways that a protein chain is getting uh, more or less attached to itself and that gives it a certain secondary structure. Um, in 1946 there's the development of nuclear magnetic resonance um, also called MRI when you're in a, in a hospital so when you're outside of a hospital an MRI machine is called an NMR machine um, and this is uh, a way to study uh, not only the structure of proteins but also the dynamics of proteins so you can um, see how they move, right? So you can see them in action. Um, when you do protein um, x-ray diffraction experiments, uh, the big issue there is, is that you have to make a, a crystal first. Um, and of course within this crystal the protein is unable to move. Um, but with NMR you can actually observe proteins doing their kind of chemical um, um, enzymatic reaction. So you can see them move, um, well not like you would, but hey, you can get data on, on what is going on in a more um, dynamic way. All right, 1949 was a, a very important year um, because this was the year where there, uh, where uh, people first succeeded to make synthetic insulin. So insulin is the um, um, is the molecule that you are lacking when you are diabetic. Um, so type one diabetics are born without the ability to to make insulin um, or they have like massive death of the uh, beta cells in the pancreas and that doesn't allow them to make insulin. Um, so the synthesis of insulin is like a major leap forward because it made it just much much cheaper for these people to kind of stay alive. Um, before that people used insulin from cows so um, every time that you needed insulin um, you would go to a pharmacist and the pharmacist would buy his insulin at the slaughterhouse. So he would go to the slaughterhouse, um, he would buy a whole bunch of pancreas um, from, from cattle and then the insulin would be extracted from the cattle pancreas. Um, of course there are some issues there because cattle insulin is slightly different than human insulin uh, which has to do with the sugar groups on the, uh, on the protein itself. Um, but uh, synthetic insulin was made for the first time in 1949 um, and that is kind of a major major invention. So in 1958 we have the first protein structures being published um, and um, not, not far behind uh, we have the first um, real electron microscopy crystallographic experiment. So hey, this is then using electron microscopy. Um, so hey, it's using a, a, a microscope which is transferring electrons. Um, so you cover a crystal or, or you cover a, a protein with, um, with gold um, molecules or gold atoms and then you have a very fine needle which allows you to more or less scan. It's not really a microscope because you're not looking through an ocular um, but it is in a way a microscope in the fact that it that it's using the same thing. So in 1967 the first protein structure by x-ray crystallog uh, crystallography was uh, was published um, and this is the fist. That there's a typo in this slide. I will fix it before I put it on Moodle. Um, and then three years later in 1970 uh, the bioinformaticians became really involved um, because this is when the first protein database was established. So the PDB is one of the oldest databases in the world. Um, the PDB database is well funded in the 1970s um, and it's still operated today. Um, so it's, it's one of these um, well databases which is more or less older than the internet because even before we had the real internet as we know it today with HTTP uh, the protein database was already there. Um, so the protein database holds protein sequences and protein structures um, and nowadays it does a lot more. All right 1975 was a big um, advancement in protein, uh, protein a study of proteins and protein mixtures. Uh, in 1975 uh, it was the invention of 2D gel electrophoresis. Um, so before that proteins would be purified to like centrifugation and other techniques um, but using 2D gel electrophoresis where you have one axis pulling the protein using um, like a, a um, uh, so one of the axes does it based on um, the um, what's it called, the isoelectric point. Um, so the isoelectric point of a protein is the pH at which a protein is neutrally charged because every protein has a little bit of charge so it's either a little bit acidic or a little bit basic. So you can use that when you make a gradient uh, to kind of separate them in their 
isoelectric point. So based on their pH more or less. And in the other axis you can separate them based on the size. So and um, you can then do protein identification because if you know the isoelectric point and you know the size of a protein you know more or less which protein it, it has to be. Then in 1976 is a major advantage in computer graphics and this is the, the first visualization of a protein structure so more or less um, very similar to the thing that I showed you in the RNA lecture uh, where we looked at the ribosome. Um, so this is the first time that anyone used a computer to visualize a, a 3D protein structure. Um, so that's a big advantage. In 1981 we have the advantage or the, uh, the invention of the ribbon diagram so we will talk a lot about ribbon diagrams and that is just an easy way to kind of write down the 3D structure or the, the tertiary structure of a protein um, and in 1999 the, the ribosome structure was more or less solved um, so using um, x-ray diffraction experiments combined with computer modeling uh, they were able to make a ribosomal model which is more or less still valid today. Um, and every time that we talk about like a, a, a protein, uh, you have to remember that you can observe a protein through a microscope unless you're using electron microscopy. Um, but um, so when we are talking about structure, we're talking about a model, so kind of a mathematical model of how the protein chain is kind of folding or, or is folded in 3D space and then when we talk about a, a, a structure uh, then you're talking about how accurate you are compared to the experiment. So you can have like a structure which is solved to a resolution of two angstroms um, or solved to a resolution of 1.4 angstroms. So had the, 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 the smaller the resolution uh, the more the model is looking like the real protein in crystal form so that's that's just a little bit of a, a, a weird thing or it's it's just something that you have to keep in your mind and when we talk about the structure of a protein we're always talking about kind of a model and models are always false um, or well they're not always false but then models are never the, the reality, uh, the reality is, is more complex, but hey, when we talk about proteins, then hey, it's the distance of uh, the, the model towards its protein structure, and that is measured in Armstrong's, which is like a, a measurement for atomic uh, distance. All right, so first off, some nomenclature about proteins. So an amino acid is a building block, so it is a very small um, chemical molecule, um, and usually, um, we talk about amino acids and then we, we talk about like the 26 or the 21 essential amino acids. Um, but hey, an amino acid is a building block, so it's a, it's a fundamental unit and you can link these together um, because every amino acid has an N-terminus and it has a C-terminus and the N-terminus of one amino acid can couple to the C-terminus of the other, other amino acid. And then hey, you can make a chain, just like DNA is a chain of, of, of base pairs, uh, a protein is a, is a chain of several amino acids. Um, however, nomenclature wise, we have to be very careful because when we talk about one chain of several amino acids that are coupled together, we are actually talking about a polypeptide. And if you have one or more polypeptides which are together, then we're talking about an apoprotein when we do not include the cofactors. So cofactors could be things like uh, an iron molecule or a zinc molecule or a copper molecule, right? So these things are not part of the amino acid chain. Uh, they are not part of an apoprotein, uh, of, a, of an apoprotein. Um, but when we have one or more of these polypeptide chains together, then we're talking about an apoprotein. And when we're talking about a protein, we mean the finished product, right? So it's it's the uh, it's an apoprotein, but then with the cofactors included, like the iron or the, the zinc or the, uh, the, the, the other molecules, uh, which are not part of any of these chains, uh, but are required for the functioning of the protein. All right, so I hope that's clear. Um, so amino acids um, are called like that because they are amino carboxylic acids. Um, hey, that means that they have an amino group, so they have an N group at the end, so an NH2 group, and they have a carboxylic acid, and a carboxylic acid group in, in chemistry is a C, o, a C double bound O and a COH uh, group. So of course when you put this in water, um, then 
this part will kind of lose the H, so it will create, if you, if you dissolve a single amino acid, it will create a H3O plus molecule, which is an, an acidic uh, molecule, um, and then the, uh, the charge, right, that's left, because then you have a negative charge on this part, uh, that will be kind of distributed between the two O's. Um, so um, there will be a, a small negative charge. So the H can drop off when you put it in water and there's a small negative charge. And this is counterbalanced by this part um, because this part is a C bound to an N with an, with an H2. So if you would dissolve that in water, then it has the ability to um, actually uh, become NH3, more or less. It won't bind it exactly, but it's kind of a, a balance. So sometimes you will have two hydrogens coupled to the N and sometimes there will be three. So there's a little bit of an additional um, residual positive charge. So here, um, if you look at a single amino acid and dissolving it in water will give a slightly negative charge on this end. It will give a slightly positive charge on that end. And that is why two of them can actually be connected together. So and this is called the primary carbon atom and this is the secondary carbon atom. So the the, the side chain, um, so the R here, um, is the thing that determines which amino acid we are looking at. Um, so the most elementary uh, amino acid, of course, is when the side chain here is just a single H, um, or actually two H's, because but there's always one H right at, at the side. Um, but if there's if if there's like two H's, uh, then this is the most simple uh, amino acid that you can imagine, and that's called glycine. Um, but the, the general structure of any amino acid is just H, uh, is, is this, and then here we have the side chain, and the side chain is kind of, can be anything. Um, and I mean literally anything. So hey, there's like 200, 300 plus amino acids known to men, um, and they all have like different, different things on this side chain. Um, but hey, for example, if the side chain is a CH3, so uh, um, um, what's that called again? Uh, well, you guys in chat might probably know CH3 chai chains. That's a, a, a pff, my chemistry is failing me here, but um, it doesn't matter. Um, but it's CH3, then it's called an alanine. Um, but you can also have like a, a benzyl group here, um, which is like a, a chain or a circle made out of, of carbon atoms. Um, methyl, that's it. Methyl, it's a methyl group. So. Um, but hey, you can, it, it can be as complex as you want. Um, so one of these things that, that, that causes or that is the result of this is that an amino acid is actually uh, chiral. So um, yeah, atyl bay, thank you, methyl group, yeah. Um, so hey, if you have a glycine and you add a methyl group to the alpha carbon atom, uh, then it will transform into an alanine. So, um, but hey, all amino acids that exist are chiral, and that is because, well, this C atom um, has three different groups uh, to it, more or less. Um, of course, if there's a COH group, then it's not, but um, but the, the idea is, is that because you have two H's here, uh, glycine is, of course, not a chiral molecule. So um, a chiral molecule, um, I have a different slide about chirality uh, to explain that, um, but just remember that amino acids are having a right-hand form and a left-hand form, um, and all naturally occurring amino acids are almost always in the L form. So at least in in most humans or um, like eukaryotes, there are some bacteria which pr produce D-form amino acids, um, but they are very uncommon. And like I told you, there's like a lot of them. So hey, because this side group can be anything, uh, there are around 500 different amino acids that are found in nature and that are known. And of course, in theory, you could nowadays synthesize any amino acid that you want um, and, and put anything on this side group. All right, so chirality means that um, because this C atom um, has the ability to make four bindings, right? So here you have the, the C atom in the middle, here you have the uh, carboxyl group and here you have the amino group so hey, this is um, if it's just taking the one slide and then turning it on the side um, and then here you see the H and here you see the R group and of course um, if you would take this right um, then because there are three little legs here and one little leg here and these have like different angles to each other um, but there's no way that you can actually 
take this thing in 3D and then turn it in such a way that it will become this one. So um, this one is the left hand side and this one is the right hand side. So in, in nature only these occur. Um, and if you chemically synthesize amino acids um, then you have to be very careful because normally you would produce both of these variants, right? If you if you would produce it using a chemical reaction uh, where you start with glycine, right, which is 2H, and then you will start adding a side group, then because of doing it chemically, um, these both versions will be, will be produced. Um, so this is very important in uh, medicine um, because there is a lot of cases where uh, synthesis goes wrong and they want to synthesize L amino acids but they synthesize a mixture with L and D amino acids and usually um, having the same amino acid in the D form is toxic to humans while the L form has like beneficial properties. Um, but hey, if you if you think about chirality, it just means that hey, every this molecule, um, if the R group is not an H, then of course there's no way to turn this one towards this one. So you can kind of visualize it in your head, and then hey, you would have like a little tripod with with a stip, with a stem up, and then you can t turn it around the stem, and you can flip it around. But hey, of course, if there's hey, if you have COH n2h or r hey, then that's of course different from having it in the other other direction um, so that's chirality i hope that's understandable like i always found chirality a really hard concept and in chemistry it is a pretty hard concept also to um, to kind of predict which one of the or which two because um, stereochemistry because normally you have standard chemistry but this this depends on stereochemistry uh, so Atobe says Contergan is an example for side effects of chiral molecules. All right, yeah, I know that the way that they used to kind of measure if something was L or if something was D um, was uh, to put it in a little cuvette, so a little thing which is like a, a so a, a holder which is square. So and normally, if you're working in a lab, all of the things are round. But a cuvette is a is a little square thing where you can put a liquid in, and then inside there is a little slit uh, where you can shine a uh, a light through, and then um, you can turn um, you can turn the uh, Polaroid filter to the left and to the right. Um, so you shine light through and then you have a Polaroid like a sunglasses so and then hey, when you turn the Polaroid then at a certain point at a certain angle uh, the light will extinguish and if you have a mixture which consists of L then you can turn it to the left and then it will e extinguish the light and if you have a mixture which contains D uh, amino acids or, or stuff which is in the D form then you have to turn it to the right side so the Polaroid filter gets turned to the right um, so that's where this stereochemistry comes from um, but I don't want to dwell too much on it but just remember that um, if there's a question on the exam and the exam question is um, most amino acids are in the mm -hmm -hmm form then you have to write L form right it's that simple so um, Alright, so let's quickly go through the 21 amino acids that are there um, and show the different side groups. Um, so of course um, all of these will have uh, an, uh, a COH group, right, and they will have an NH2 group. So this is the, the C terminus, this is the N terminus of the single amino acid. And then here we see the side group. So this is a very long side group. Yeah, so it has one, two, three C atoms. And then you have this part which is the uh, which is composed of a, of a, of a nitrogen and then other nitrogens bound to it. Um, and all of the amino acids in the A group here, uh, these are amino acids which have electrostatically charged side chains. So why are we doing only 21? Why are we not going through all 500? Well, first off, time is limited and I don't want to do all 500 of them, uh, but these are the ones which are the essential amino acids. So if you're missing any one of these, um, then you actually die. So you, you can't live without having these 21 because you if you don't have all 21 of them, you can't build, for example, a ribosome. And if you can't build a ribosome, you can't make new proteins. Um, so, and so these are the ones which you, you absolutely have to have um, before you can start doing anything. 
Um, so he arginine, histidine and lysine are the three amino acids which are positively charged. Um, and he most of this positive charge is, is very um, uh, is, is located or is made by uh, an NH3 group um, so here NH3 the H can fall off and uh, then it then it will or, uh, NH3 so this this N actually has like four bindings while a nitrogen normally can only have three bindings so arginine histidine lysine those are the positive ones um, and then there are two negative amino acids or two negative essential amino acids which are aspartate aspartic acid and glutam glutamic acid um, and these have a carboxyl group here so of course this part here is also having a charge this part here is having a charge but these charges are normally um, because you have many of them behind each other um, it doesn't there's only a little charge at the end and a little bit of charge at the other end um, so a little bit of a negative charge at the C terminus a little bit of a positive charge at the uh, at the N terminus um, but that kind of evens out while well, these charges are real charges so these if you would dissolve aspartic acid in water um, then this will start binding um, um, or then this will this will cause the water to become acidic and this will be this will cause the water to become uh, basic, so uh, the other side of acidic. All right, so those are the first two. So then we have also amino acids with uncharged polar side chains. Um, so these don't have any charge, um, but these are the ones which um, like being in, um, um, in, in near fat, right? Because they have like uh, chains of C atoms, not too long of a chain. Um, yeah, but these ones, they, they love uh, dissolving in water because they are polar. Um, so they have like an OH group. Um, so they, they feel very good when they are um, in, in the water. So if you're thinking about a protein, uh, then usually the outside of the protein, um, so the, the part of the protein which is in contact with water, will be made out of uh, serine, threonine, aspargine, or glutamine. Um, so these are not the ones that like cell membranes, these are the ones which like water. So they, they like being in water. Um, there are some special cases, so the special cases are actually for uh, structural things. Uh, the cysteine and the selanocysteine will come back um, because they have this uh, sulfur molecule, so they have a, a sulfur atom in their, uh, as their side chain, and these are able to form bridges. So you can have a, an, uh, a real atomic bond between a, a cysteine and another cysteine. So that means that physically they are coupled together, um, just like the NH2 group is coupled to the next um, uh, carboxylic group. Um, so these, these cause physical attachments between molecules, like real, um, not like metal ionic bindings, but they, they cause a real atomic bound between uh, two parts of the same chain. Um, then you have glycine. Um, glycine is of course weird because it has no side chain. It's the, the basis on which everything is formed. And then you have proline and proline is a little bit weird because it has a ring structure. Um, but the ring structure is actually coupled to the um, NH, uh, NH2 group, right? So normally you would have an NH2 group here, uh, but proline doesn't have, it, it doesn't follow the standard structure, right? Here there should be the side chain, but the side chain is actually folding back and touching the amino group. Um, so it, 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 it the, the, the secondary uh, or the, 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 the secondary carbon or atom is, is connected to the N atom twice. Um, so that's why it's a little bit strange. Um, and this makes it, uh, <coughs> uh, this makes it planar. So it is a, it is a flat, um, it is a flat um, amino acid. So if you would look at it um, under a microscope, yeah, then all of them will have things sticking out or sticking to one side. Um, but these ones will, uh, the proline one is actually flat. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of real 2D molecule. All right, and then we have some other amino acids, and these are the amino acids with hydrophobic side chains. So the hydrophobic side chains are the ones which like being in the cell wall because hey, they have these um, carbon chains um, or a lot of carbon or like different like 
little carbon um, grappler, grappling hooks. Um, uh, the methionine is, is a little bit interesting because it also has a sulfur group. But all of these, uh, they are very into being into an environment with other carbon atoms. So they don't like to be in water, they like to kind of stick together um, and kind of clump up. And that is because they, they have, uh, they are, um, if you remember from chemistry, you have like things which are hydrophilic and things which are hydrophobic. So these are hydrophobic, so they don't like water. And the hydrophilic ones, the ones that were here before, uh, these are the ones which like water. So these are on the outside of the protein, and these generally are found on the inside of the protein, or they are found on the outside of the protein, but then the protein is embedded in the cell wall, because the cell wall, of course, is made out of, uh, out of uh, kind of fat molecules. All right, so those are all the amino acids. So 21, um, you don't have to learn them all, but you, you have to kind of remember which groups there are. Um, and um, remember that glycine is the only one which is not, uh, uh, which is not a, a chiral, chiral uh, amino acid. All right, so then we, we said that the next step, so we go from amino acids to polypeptides, right? Um, and polypeptides are amino acid chains together using peptide bonds, right? So they are, the peptide bonds are when you take an amino acid and then this amino acid is bound to another amino acid. So here we see the N terminus of the first one. So this is, which one is this people? With the methyl group? Methyl group? So it's, it's glycine with the methyl group, then we have Quick question for you guys. Just throw it in chat. No answer, no guesses. You guys knew it was a methyl group, but now you already forgot the name. All right, so the name of course is alanine. Very good. <laughs> All right, so it's uh, no glycine. Glycine is the one which has no uh, side chain. So glycine uh, is is the one without any of the side chain. So um, here, um, the the third one here, this is glycine, because it has this um, a, oh, it has this H group, right? So that means that there are two H's. So it's glycine, and if you have a CH three group, so if you have a methyl group to it, it's the uh, it's the uh, alanine. Right? I always get them mixed up anyway. Don't remember the names, just it's methylglycine. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah, you could always just say something like that. So call it methylglycine. No, we're not going to call it methylglycine, but it's not that important how they are called. Right? It's also, I'm not going to have you learn all of the short names for them because every amino acid has a full name, then you have a three letter code and then you have a single letter code, but that's not what you what you need to learn and what you need to learn is that they come in like four to five groups so they are electrically charged like positive and negative electric charge they are polar right meaning or hydrophilic meaning that they like water uh, there are some special cases like the the ones which have the uh, uh, the sulfur group and then you have one big group and those are the ones which are hydrophobic uh, so those are the ones that do not like water that's if, if you know it in that detail, then that's more than enough for me. Um, so, but um, if we talk then about polypeptides, right? So make a chain out of different amino acids, um, then um, we arrange them always from the N terminus to the C terminus. It's like we in DNA, we write everything from five prime to three prime to not confuse ourselves. Um, uh, in, in, in protein work, we always go from N to C because those things are not in that order in the alphabet. It's, it's, I don't know, like five prime to three prime because five is bigger than three. That might make sense as a rule of thumb, but going from N to C, it doesn't really make sense. But just remember, you write them from the N terminus towards the C terminus, writing them the other way around is just wrong. So, all right, and these things are called peptide bonds. So when you have this, um, um, carboxylic group from the one bound to the uh, amida group from the other one um, head then you have uh, a C and then head the O is being used up so there's no COH anymore but the C couples to the N um, and then head this then is a peptide bond 
and these are atomic bonds so they are very strong you can easily break those um, so that's why an amino acid or a protein generally has a very um, tough structure all right, so the primary structure of them is very comparable to DNA. Like I told you, we write them down from the N terminus to the C terminus. However, if you have cysteines in there, it is not a normal linear structure, right? If you write down a, D, uh, a structure on DNA, you say C, T, A, G, A, T, C, 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 G, A, T, blah. Um, but in um, amino acids, uh, it's not that simple. So uh, in polypeptides, it's not that simple. So if you write down the primary structure of a polypeptide, um, then uh, the problem is, is that you have sometimes these cysteines, right, uh, which have this uh, sulfur group. So the sulfur group couples to another sulfur group. So here, this is the primary structure of oxycotton uh, or, or of oxytocin, the, uh, the happy hormone. So the thing that, that makes you feel um, happy. Um, and this hormone has two cysteines in there and these coupled together. So the proper way to write this down is to start with the cysteine because that's at the end terminus. Then you have tyrosine, isoleucine, glycine, asperta, uh, as asparagine. Uh, then you have another cysteine and this cysteine is physically attached to this other cysteine because these two sulfur molecules, they form a, a atomic bond. Right, so there's a there's kind of had this molecule, the cysteine here is coupled to the cysteine, but it's also coupled to the cysteine via this. So you already see that here some structure starts getting into um, the sequence because the sequence is not just a linear sequence when we talk about protein; it is more or less already a a kind of flat surface. And then the cysteine goes to proline, leucine, and glycine, and then we are at the C terminus. So this is a very small um, a protein or a, a very small polypeptide um, but the, the structure is already a little bit more complex right and it's not if you would write this down just cysteine tyrosine isoleucine, and you would not deal with this ss uh, so this um, a sulfur sulfur bond uh, then um, it would be wrong so if you would just write them in a sequence like you would do with dna then that would not be the, the proper primary structure So the oxy, uh, ox, oxytocin, the happy hormone thing, this is a very basic example. If we look at um, insulin, for example, the molecule which is very important for when you have diabetes, then writing down the primary structure is already difficult much much more difficult than with oxytocin and that is because these uh, cysteines right that we have here which have these ss uh, bindings so this uh, sulfur to sulfur bindings they can actually bind two peptides or two um, polypeptides together right so here we're talking about a protein or an apoprotein um, although I don't know exactly if insulin has a cofactor, but hey, if it would have a cofactor, then it would be an apoprotein because we don't, we're not writing down the, the cofactor. Um, but actually, insulin consists of two polypeptide chains. So you have the alpha chain and you have the, the beta chain. And here, because you write it always from N terminus to C terminus, you have to do a little bit of trickery. Um, but these two chains are connected to each other physically so they are physically attached to each other um, based on the uh, one two three four five six seven so the seven cysteine is connecting the alpha chain to the beta chain and this is the one two three four five six seven so the seven cysteine of the beta chain is connected to the seven cysteine of the alpha chain the sixth cysteine of the alpha chain is actually coupled to the uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, to the eleven cysteine of the alpha chain, and then it continues, and then had the the, the cysteine one before the end of the um, of the first alpha chain is coupled again to the beta chain. So you can see that this already becomes a lot more complex, right? The, these these, uh, but since the primary structure is based on atomic bonds, um, you do have to take care of of these atomic bonds. So um, that's the that's the thing how we how we write them down. So I think this is enough about primary structure. But primary structures in proteins are already complex and they are difficult to write down uh, because you have to know which cysteine binds which cysteine um, because of these. And then you still have the solanocysteine, which can also do that. But remember the primary structure of um, proteins or polypeptides is based on atomic 
bindings. So not on hydrogen bindings, not on Van der Waals powers or other things. No, they are based on atomic bindings. All right, so then we have the next level of structure. So pr primary structure is only the first level of structure and it's relatively easy for a computer to figure out, right? Since we're doing bioinformatics, I, I want to say that um, if you give a computer a primary structure, um, for example, the two polypeptides of insulin, then the computer can figure out for you what the primary structure is. If you just give it the, the like non-folded structure, yeah, so you would just give it the, the the amino acids in order, you would give it the amino acids of this thing in order, then it can figure out that these two are going to bind together and these two are going to bind together as well, based on the distances. So this is, for a computer, this is relatively easy to figure out. Um, when we talk about secondary structure, uh, then we're talking about kind of the 3D form of local segments of the biopolymer. So uh, a protein or a, uh, or, a poly, uh, or a polypeptide can also be called biopolymers um, and they have like a secondary structure and the secondary structure in proteins are two um, so there's two different secondary structures uh, one of them is the alpha helix so that's when um, it it rolls up into a helix and then you have the beta sheet and that is when two of these um, chains are more or less parallel to each other so a secondary structure does not describe the specific atomic position in 3D space. It just tells you how the, the chain is folding up onto itself. And also this is still relatively well predicted using a computer. So computers are pretty good in predicting secondary structures um, and primary structures. So for example, the alpha helix, um, here you see an example of this alpha helix. So here we see the, the, the N-terminus and here we see the C-terminus um, and here we see a piece of DNA. So here we see a leucine zipper and this leucine zipper is made out of, uh, of two polypeptide chains. So this is one protein, right? The leucine zipper is a protein. Um, the DNA in this case is its cofactor, so we're really looking at a protein. And these uh, leucine zippers, they have um, two um, polypeptide chains and every chain consists of two of these um, alpha helices. So an alpha helix is formed when the NH group of an amino acid forms a hydrogen bond with the CO group of the amino acids four residues earlier. So and then when you look at the turn of this helix there are around 3.6 residues in each of these helical turn or exactly 3.6 residues. Um, we will zoom into it a little bit. So the amino acid side chains are on the outside of the helix and point towards the end terminus. So how does this look? If we look here and then we zoom a little bit into the uh, into the alpha helix. Um, so at the secondary structure when we are talking about alpha helices and beta sheet is not well, it is dependent on the atomic bonds, but on top of that, you are now incorporating hydrogen bonds between the different um, C and N termini, right? So not about it's not about side chains. This is about the the the, the chain, so the the chain of amino acids. Um, and then here we're talking about the the H, so the the H on the N terminus of the one coupling to the uh, to the C so to the carboxyl group of the same residue or of the of the of, of something of the same chain four residues away so you can see here this is one residue two residues three residues and then four residues so where are here the side chains um, oh this picture doesn't really show the side chains but the side chains of course are on this C Right, so every time on this C, there is the side chain, and this the, the side chain here is always pointing towards the end terminus. So it's pointing kind of backwards, right? So here the side group would go this way. So if this would be one of these long, um, uh, long uh, side chains with a lot of C atoms, uh, then it would always point this way, right? And then and this one here would also point this way. And this one here would also point that way. And that is because of the 3D structure. So hey, it points the side chains towards the more or less the start of the helix. All right, so that's the uh, that's the alpha helices. Um, they are actually shown as little barrels. So this is now shown as a as a helix. Um, but when you when you draw them on paper, it's a it's a barrel. So it's a it's a it's a cylinder um, on 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 a secondary structure picture. So beta sheets come in two form. Um, so it's a flat structure. So um, if you're thinking about 
biology or uh, or um, and proteins being like um, like construction vehicles, like cranes and, and elevators and these kinds of things, then the beta sheet is more or less a flat structure. So it, it's it's really flat, like it's a single molecule layer um, in which like the two chains are more or less at the same. And they can become, they can be very big, so they can more or less make like a whole square construction site, right, to do things on. Um, so um, hey, like an alpha helix is something which is like strong and a little bit flexible uh, a beta sheet is rigid and you can put things on there so hey, that's how these things function so it's again a flat structure it's based on hydrogen bonding um, and the strand falls back onto itself so in case here we see like one strand but it's the same strand so we have like hey, so if the n-terminus would be here then this is the n-terminus and then we go and then it loops around and then the c-terminus would be here and the same thing holds here. If this would be the N terminus, then it would loop around and then this would be the C terminus. Um, so there are two important forms of beta sheets, one of them which is the parallel form and one of them which is the anti-parallel form. So in the parallel form, the side chains are all pointing to the same direction, right? So they are point, both of them here are pointing left and both of these are pointing right. Um, for you guys, it might be the other way around, but hey, you can see that here, both of the side chains, they point towards the same direction, and here they point towards the other direction. In an anti-parallel sheet, it's different because the two side chains are pointing towards each other, and then on the next amino acid, they are pointing toward, they, they are pointing away from each other, right? So this, this is a very big difference um, if, you, if you talk about how these things structure. And if, you, if you're talking about a beta sheet, then it is always shown in higher level structures as, a, as an arrow. And this is where the ribbon diagram comes from, right? In the 1980s, some, some guy had the idea like, oh, but if we draw a protein structure, hey, then we should draw a beta sheet as being an arrow, and we should draw an alpha helix as being a little cylinder. Um, and that was, that was enough for a nature publication back then. So it just saying, oh, alpha helix, no, that's a barrel, beta sheet, no, that's an arrow. So that's, that's one major invention. Um, he didn't get a Nobel Prize for it, but almost. So, all right. So here we see then the tertiary structure. So the tertiary structure of a protein is his three-dimensional structure as defined by atomic coordinates. Right, so uh, the forces which determine the tertiary structure are not just atomic bonds, and hydrogen bonding, no. Now we also take into account the ionic bondings, if from any uh, ions, like uh, plus minus bondings, right? Uh, we take again, uh, we take uh, the hydrophobic interactions into account and all the disulfide bonds. But the disulfide bonds are part of the atomic bonds, right? So it's the, it's the same. So this together with the amino sequence makes the primary structure, then the secondary structure is including the hydrogen bonds, and then the tertiary structure is then including also the ionic bond and the hydrophobic interactions. Right, so here we see um, a protein. Uh, we see here that this protein consists of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, give or take beta sheets and there is uh, like a very small alpha helix here and then there is a very big alpha helix here or this could actually be three different alpha helices hey, but here we see what, a, what uh, a ribbon diagram can do for you hey, because it can show you kind of the structure of the thing in three dimensions um, but the tertiary structure of a protein is actually based on the three-dimensional uh, coordinates so hey, this is the thing which you measure when you do x-ray diffraction experiments uh, then you're determining the tertiary structure um, uh, of, of a protein. And this is almost impossible to predict for a computer. I say almost impossible because we're getting better and better at it, and we will get back to that, uh, because there have been some major advancements in the last year. Um, so I made a couple of, well, I made one new slide for you guys. since the major advancement. I thought it only warranted one slide, um, but it is a major advancement in, in, in protein and bioinformatics work based on, on predicting these structures uh, from the original sequence of the amino acids. 
All right, so then we talk about the quaternary structure, because there's always an additional level in proteins. And the quaternary structure is the arrangement of many, of multiple folded proteins or coiled proteins in a multi, uh, in a multi subunit complex with cofactors. So um, here we see the structure of hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin is the thing that transports uh, oxygen in your, in your blood cells. So hemoglobin is made up of four polypeptide chains. So it's four times, or it's two times an alpha chain and two times a beta chain. So it's like uh, the red ones are alpha, the blue ones are, are beta, or the other way around. Um, and then you have four iron atoms, uh, four iron ions. So hey, here we include the covariate, uh, cofactors. So the cofactors are included in uh, the, the quaternary structure. They are not in the tertiary structure. So the tertiary structure is the, is more or less the apoprotein, and then this is the final protein, is the final level, is the assembly of multiple apoproteins together with their cofactors in there. Um, so I think that the uh, the iron molecules they are here. These are in the middle here. They have the heme group. So the heme group is a, is a little. Um, is an iron molecule surrounded by a little net and oxygen comes in and is bound here. So every um, hemoglobin molecule can carry four uh, oxygen molecules with it to supply oxygen from the, the lungs to, to the muscles, for example. All right, let me look at the time. I have been recording for 50 minutes, so um, I think we should do a short break um, so that I can stop the recording and show you guys some commercials uh, again like um, I'm not in it for making money <laughs> I just find it funny that you already paid a cup of coffee for me uh, so uh, I will be back in uh, like 10 minutes 15 minutes um, I, I have to go to the toilet and uh, drink something because my throat hurts a little bit um, and then I will be back um, and then we will continue talking about proteins and um, how to detect proteins and how bioinformatics is, is involved in, in proteomics. Alright, so 